pray. God of abundant life, your grace sustains us every day. So nourish us by your word and fill us with your spirit so that we may grow in faith and love through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So in addition to the reading from Isaiah and the prayer of St. Francis, we just heard lovely sung by Robin. We want to hear now words from the Apostle Paul. This is to the church in Rome, chapter 14, the first 10 verses. Paul writes this. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they will stand or fall. They will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Now some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let each be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, let them observe it to honor the Lord. Those who eat, let them eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, let them abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. For we do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. So why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? And you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Earlier this week, we as a church received some sad news in the mail. One of our new members, someone who had visited our church early in 2020, but then who had joined the church during the time of the COVID closure, wrote to me and asked to have his name removed from our membership roles. Churches don't often talk about members who leave them. Now, it's sure, some people move away and go to a new town and then eventually transfer membership to a different congregation. Other people sometimes just stop attending. They're quietly angry or frustrated about something, and then over a period of years, because of their absence, finally they're removed from the rolls. But this young man wrote to me, angry that we had chosen to close our church because of the coronavirus health directives from Governor Wolf. He believed that it was an infringement on the freedom of religion. He was also angry that we had voiced support for the Black Lives Matter movement and that we'd held a vigil around our church in June after the death of George Floyd. This was the first I had heard of his displeasure, so I wrote back a letter describing briefly how for the health of our staff and for the congregation, we chose it to be wise to close the church to follow the guidance of the governor. And that given the diversity of our congregation, plus our commitment to Christian values of justice for all, we choose to speak out on behalf of people of color, to denounce acts of racially biased police brutality. I don't think he was interested in a dialogue, so we'll discuss as a session his request to remove his name from our roles. If a church has doors that are open to everyone so that all can freely enter and grow in their faith as part of a diverse congregation, then the church doors need to swing both ways. We must be willing to allow people to leave if they feel God is leading them to another congregation, if the Spirit is convicting them that their gifts can be better used in another church, or if the seeds of faith that we've planted simply are not able to take root 
in a person's individual life. EOPC will never be all things to all people. And yes, it's sad when people leave. It's particularly sad when people have been active and friends in the church. And we must always be willing to look honestly at ourselves and to hear words even of criticism that are raised. But we must also always be willing to speak and to give a defense of the values that we hold to be important. And if we're able to do that, then we will be a church of substance and not just of style. Now, before this entire sermon gets way too serious, I want to share another story, but I'll only share it as long as you promise it is not the only thing you're going to remember from today's sermon. It's actually a true story. Years ago, a friend of mine had been dating a woman for a relatively short period of time when he decided she was the one for him. And so he took her to a nice restaurant, and he planned to propose to her at the restaurant. He wanted to dress up as a knight in shining armor, but he could only afford to rent the helmet. And so he excused himself, and he went into the restroom where he wrapped his arms and his body and his legs in aluminum foil. And then he put on the helmet, and he returned to the table holding an engagement ring. Now, as he knelt before the woman, all she could think of was, my God, I'm being proposed to by a giant baked potato. <laughs> On that day, she did not accept his impetuous offer. I'm afraid it was an example of style distracting from substance. So an awkward decision involving aluminum foil led to a failed marriage proposal. In the case I mentioned earlier, a set of strong opinions that somehow believe Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization and that somehow churches shouldn't heed CDC guidelines has led to a failed church relationship. But there's something deeper here than is simply determining who was right and who was wrong. Listen again to Paul's opening words in Romans 14. Paul said, Welcome those who are weak, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. The Apostle Paul led young Christian congregations that included Jewish believers and Gentile converts. It involved people who their entire life had followed strict dietary laws and others who had grown up believing you could eat whatever you wished. There were some people who had been taught to light a candle on Friday evenings as the Sabbath would begin, and new Christian believers who chose to gather on Sunday because that was the day of Christ's Easter resurrection. Paul, knowing all this, doesn't jump into the fray and try to decree which side is right and which side is wrong. He characterizes that as quarreling over opinions. And in many ways, the habits and the practices of the early church and even of the church today are really at their foundation more about style than about substance. And Paul says there's a deeper question that we need to remember and ask ourselves, namely, are my actions giving honor to God in Christ? Now Paul put it this way in those verses. He said, some of you judge one day to be better than another. Others judge all days to be alike. Yet whichever day is observed, let it be done in honor of the Lord. Likewise, those of you who eat certain foods, eat in honor of God. And those who abstain, abstain in honor of God. But none of us live or die to ourselves. If we live we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord so that whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Paul wants us to take a step back and to ask those substantive questions. How do my choices, how do my actions truly honor God? Am I looking for an argument or for a discussion? Am I anxious to prove that my ways are superior to someone who believes differently? 
And will my behavior, will my language shut down all future conversation? Or can I somehow raise the topic in a way that allows for discussion, consensus, maybe even mutual service? Last week I spoke about the art of thinking small. How we're called to pay attention to details to seek to resolve our conflicts as best we can in one-on-one conversations, and to trust that even little acts of kindness go farther than we can imagine. Well, this week I want to pair the art of thinking small with a more broad perspective that calls us to trust that the substance of believing in God, of believing in a risen Christ, goes beyond the superficialities of church styles and denominational practices. The substance of faith contains that bold affirmation, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Only when that big picture substance is clear can we then move on to secondary details about, well, where and when should we worship? What should we eat? What song should we sing? and all of those superficial details. A couple of days ago, I had the opportunity to speak to a group of 24 students who were studying at the University of Pitt to become social workers. This group of talented women and men had each intentionally chosen a vocation in which they would use their learning to go forth and make a difference in the world to help people as they deal with sexual violence and substance abuse and racist structural inequities in our own community. They would gain the skills so they could teach clients how to access resources that be needed to provide food and health care and housing, how they could become partners in programs to find a better future for themselves and their children. But in our conversation, I told this group of future social workers they will only be fully effective in their work if they also find ways to talk about faith and spirituality. Now, no, that doesn't mean that part of their intake interviews mean they're going to grill a person on whether they're Protestant or Catholic, on whether they like amazing grace or a mighty fortress is our God better, whether they pray before meals, whether they make pledges to their church's annual stewardship campaigns. It meant instead that they need to creatively find ways to ask questions like, what gives you hope? What are the dreams that you have for yourself and for your children? And is life trustworthy? And if it is, how do you know that? I reminded these social workers that true change is only possible when we tap into these deeper substance questions around motivations, around faith, whether the people they're in discussion with are willing to attend a 12-step group that's going to ask about a higher power, whether they find strength knowing that people beside them in the pew or in the temple or the mosque care for them and are praying for them. See, Paul... Paul gets to the very heart of the matter for social workers and for us. If we live, then we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord so that whether we live or whether we die, in all of our days and places, we are the Lord's. The substance of our faith insists that we are not alone, that God is near to all of us. The style of our faith, well, that's where music and menu, and calendars come in as we live in our own communities of faith. But substance should always take precedence over style. Many of those social workers wrote a short email to me after the class and thanked me for the presentation and commented that they hoped they would find ways to incorporate a spiritual perspective in their work going forward. My aluminum foil covered friend did eventually find a companion to share with him in his life journey. And he remains a good friend who is always the first to laugh at his youthful foibles. 
But our disgruntled, soon-to-be former member of ELPC, I don't know what comes next for him. Given the tone of his letter, as I said, I don't think he was truly seeking dialogue about our differences. He seemed quite sure about what he believed. But the wisdom of Paul remains helpful when he instructs us not to pass judgment on our brother or sister. That even though this person chose to exit our church doors, he is still known by God. He's still loved by God. He's still moving about in a world that's designed and maintained and has been redeemed by God. See, John 3.16 famously says, God so loved the world that God gave the only Son so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. And that's true. But the real substance of our faith, the good news for us, comes in the next verse in John 3, 17. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. The substance of our faith says that Christ is active in the world, in our church and outside our church walls, in our faith tradition and beyond our doctrines, our dogmas, our denominational identities. And God is going to be active in ways that we may understand and condone and celebrate. But at times, God may be active in ways that are uncomfortable to us or will be perplexing to us or at times simply amazing in their breadth and depth and height. And such is the substance of our faith, and that is our greatest comfort. For it is not for us to understand all. It is simply for us to affirm to all, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Thanks be to God. Amen.